Vintage Magic. Game. Collect. Invest. For more information about our consulting and professional services, visit VintageMagic.com. All right, guys, welcome back. It's me, Daniel, with VintageMagic.com. And what we have here today is a box sent to us from Jane. Uh, he is just uh, has some old cards that he just had for years. And I just want to show you a collection, I guess. By the way, I think he used FedEx office packaging because it's really well done. Um, if you look at it, just the box and then he even like wrap, double wrapped it right here. Uh, that's kind of cool. They do a good job at FedEx office. So, looks like there's a bag here. Okay. Gonna lift the bag up. There you go. Like that. And that's all she wrote. So, how's you guys the weekend going? Are you guys watching the football games? Put in the comments below who's gonna win the Super Bowl. Uh, it's pretty crazy, man. Uh, the Baltimore Ravens lost their ass yesterday, and now in the Kansas City game. Versus Houston Texans, it's been pretty crazy too. Uh, I don't know. Seahawks are playing here shortly, so we're going to be watching that. What's this? It's like an old school box here. It's a blister CD model kit. Yeah, I like to show these collection videos once in a while. You never know what you get, type of things. And uh, yeah, it's always fun. Kind of see what's out there. Uh, yes, the market's a little soft. I 100% agree with that. Made a lot of videos on that before, but as you guys have heard me say, and Rudy from Alpha Investments, the market is quiet. But let's take a look what we have here. So I'll just do this big dog later. What is this? That's kind of cool. It's like a... Uh, this is so old, guys. Look at this. A CD-ROM drive. Wow. Have you guys seen that before? That right there is vintage. Wow. That is nuts. All right, so this is not what to do. This is a, a clear example of not to handle your cards. Look at that. Came in like that. Pretty much just loose. So what you need to do here to take care of the cards is you need to make sure that they are, there's no movement. And in this case, oops, what happened was the, oh, these are curl too. He used uh, one of those plastic containers. Here we go, that broke. That happens quite a bit. And this looks like a bunch of revised cards. There's a few more revised decks. Yeah, this could be obviously, you know, this would be a little bit longer video with all the different cards and stuff. Uh, but yeah, I just want to take a look at what he has here and go through them. All right, so let's take a look. All right, so first off, first things first, the shenanigans of this big mess. Oh, here we go. There's a scrub lamp that's curled up. Uh, I'm going to throw this thing away, or I don't know how to do this. I'm going to, I don't know. I'm going to figure this out. All right, whatever. So, I'm going to put the more interesting cards here. You see, it's unlimited planes. Or there's a Caracas. That's good. Another Scrubland. Yeah, you know, typically, guys, I really would like you guys to organize these better. Um... It's a little pain in the butt to organize these things, to be honest. More than Paladin, but this does not work much, but let's put these in here. It looks like a white weenie deck, in a way. There's some unlimited cards. All right, so I think I'm going to use this just because of the mess. Card, okay. Sarah Angel Unlimited. Yeah, so. Yeah, what do you guys think about the market? Do you guys think it's uh, gone soft? Have you guys uh, not cared at all? Most of you guys are just, oops, I don't think you guys are just players and such anyway. 
Uh, I mean, what do you think? Do you think the market's kind of gone to a different direction? You know, a lot of people tell me that they're looking to um, sell out because they don't know what's going to happen. Um, I always recommend this. Like, if you're not going to actually... If, if you know, if you're not really a collector, like an investor of any kind, and you're just collecting and stuff, selling out uh, versus taking some profits is always and always a bad thing. Um, the main reason why I say that is because you'll end up paying more to buy the cards back. Chances are that happens all the time, and it's a tough thing. Tough thing. Okay. Fountain of Youth. Sarah Angel. Sarah Angel. A lot of white cards here. Maybe they were. Oh, there's a weak spell. Yeah, it looks, you know, looks to me this collection so far probably has every color. I wouldn't guess that it's just white. It isn't icy. So there was probably some unlimited starter stuff going on here. Uh,. That's kind of my initial. This is kind of like all like little playables or something the guy had. You know, I require... Yeah, this is, this is green and white, yeah. Look, I, I really, really require more organization of these. Um, tend, I tend to because they te this is kind of a big mess. But I, I told James I'd help him out, kind of look at it. Uh, let me go from there. But... Yeah, these are kind of nice. Oh, there's a lion's eye, a random lion's eye diamond. You like that? This is so, so freaking weird. I, I don't understand why there's a random lion's eye diamond. Here's a Helen Mine, fourth edition. I love Force of Nature. I don't know if you guys like Force of Nature. One of my favorite cards, Mine were Elves. Not worth anything, really, but. Oh, oh I just ruined it all. Oops. That's... Sorry about that. All right. So, let's see. Lion's ring, that's not really... Yeah, I mean, a lot of people tell me that the problem with the market is really liquidity. Uh, if there's not a lot of liquidity going on, they feel like the market um, is not healthy. Um, I would debate that uh, heavily because just because there's no liquidity doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything at all. Wow, the Texans were up 24 to 0, and now it's 24 to 21. It's crazy. Uh, Kansas City came back. That's absolutely nuts. Just give you guys a reference in the game. Yeah, liquidity is really important to a lot of people as a benchmark of actual, um, you know, the market itself. But the pro the thing is, I think there's a couple factors that I don't really, I, I think people don't forget is that magic is somewhat seasonal for the older stuff. A lot of people spend more money in the um, older markets when it's summertime, springtime, fall, um, or they do long-term payment plans. Another thing that I do a lot is if you're looking for cards as a long-term payment plan, I just require about a 20% non-refundable down payment that is basically uh, used to, uh, you know, as uh, you, you, you'll get, the, you'll use it against the item you're buying. However, if uh, you, you uh, don't pay for it for any reason, you lose that. And most people end up paying for it. Most people, uh, some people don't, but I feel like, you know, that, that is a thing. A lot of people, uh, you know, kind of, you know, can't budget a big purchase, but they can finance. And I generally charge a literal, a little bit of interest. I've started doing that over the years because of the fact that prices do go up, especially for marquee cards, especially bigger Power 9 cards. And it's, you know, obviously as a business, it makes no sense for me to just charge uh, the market price at that moment. I'm going to use some of these cases here a different way. It just makes no sense. So, something to consider if you're looking to do. Here's a revise. Let's see, what do we have here? Uh, four revised starter decks. 
something to consider if you're looking to budget. I, I highly, you know, like I've been saying in all my other videos, don't ever buy cards just because you are, uh, you know, like in. Yeah, buy cards based off of your like love for the cards, love for collecting. Um, I feel like a lot of people try to do this as a business and as an investor, and it it always fails pretty much if they don't have enough capital to sustain. Uh, I'm not saying it always fails; it just highly fail. It fails a lot because. You got to have, you know, a lot, a lot of people ask me like, well, why can't I just do this business like you're doing? You know, it seems easy enough and I can just do this, you know, when I have free time from work, free time from the kids, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. So it, that sounds great in theory, but when you actually start doing this business, it ends up becoming a time suck and for a little reward if you can't really get enough ROI to make it happen, to make it worthy. So that's kind of one of the biggest things that people understand is that there's a lot of effort, a lot of sorting, a lot of negotiating, a lot of just, I don't want to call it dead time because it's not dead time, but it's, it's a lot of just time that isn't necessarily making money. You know, like, so typically when you work at a job, what happens is you have to, you clock in, you do your routine, you get paid. And it doesn't matter if you go to the bathroom 500 times and it doesn't matter if you, well, it does matter, but you know, it, it just, it, it doesn't matter that much. You know, it, you can photocopy stuff. You can walk around, have coffee. I mean, I remember corporate sales back in the day, people were literally walking around talking and socializing with each other, especially in corporate sales. And there's easily, I would say an hour or two of dead time a day. And then you also have your lunches, which is another hour, maybe an hour and a half, two hours. I mean, it could be a longer lunch. So, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, you could literally spend a ton of time just wasted, wasted away. Let's well, revise starter deck with the rares being Fungosaur, Personal Incarnation, and the Clockwork Beast. But uh, that's kind of what happens. It gets wasted away, and you end up having this, uh, I don't know, situation where it's pretty hard. You know, it's a pretty hard um, thing to justify. I think a lot of people say, well, Dan, you got into it really low, so yeah, it's easy for you to say that, um, and you know, yada, 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 you know, and I, I, I get that. I get that there's, you know... Getting an entry point is a factor to the whole equation, right? There has to be an entry point that, you know, if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. And a lot of people always ask, well, does it ever make sense? Like, does it make sense anymore? And we also have an Ice Age booster box, about four to $500 net, usually after eBay fees and such, sales, factory sealed. Uh, nothing wrong with the seal. Just remember this. These have to have this. I can just tell. People ask me why is there no wizards seal. Well, that's not what they did back in the day. Back in the 95. I don't remember exactly what era they did that, but they didn't do that. Yeah, that, that's not something they did. I have to find out probably why. I see here is just a bunch of homelands. Not sure there's anything and that's the thing is you know a lot of people are, you know like have an expectation that yeah the return should be massive and there's a lot of you know possible gain quickly and i'm just pulling some old school cards out they're not necessarily worth much but yeah it's just you know that's not how it works you know the way it works is you have a lot of this kind of i would say it, it really inventory you'll never even touch uh unless you're really aggressive um, and just moving it fast, you'll store it, you might sort it, and you'll spend a lot of time just inheriting or getting collections that are just grandfathered from, you know, years and years of just stuff. And they're not necessarily going to, like, a lot of these cards may, sp some might just spike, 
Some may never spike and you may never care. That's the thing. You may never even go back because at a certain point in your business, uh, if you reach a certain level, you're not going to spend the time to even care about, uh, I know it sounds a little lame, but like finding that lion's eye diamond and that mir one mirage set that you bought that one time. And a lot of reason why is because, well, it's just, it takes more work. For the amount of time it takes to find the car, find the cards in the collection, that's another thing. Finding it, it, it it's literally going to take you so much time and just sifting through it all. And unless you have something where it's an obviously thing, like everybody talks about, well, how do you set it up? How do you get, you know, I, I use more bin systems. I use a lot of bank safes, um, but it's hard. I mean, it's really hard. So yeah, with all those factors, like starting a business, it really takes a lot of uh, dedication and a commitment and time. Uh, it's, it takes money, right? It takes there's a lot of things. It's it's not just like selling cards. I don't even know. I don't think festivals are doing. I don't think it's just selling cards and all that stuff. I think it's just selling and buying. It's you know one of those things. Another people, thing people ask me also is like what uh, what do people like? How do you find people to sell you things? Like probably one of the number one questions is how do I be like you? How do I start a business? You know how do I get into it? And the number one thing I always mention to people to start the business is you've got to have an incredible amount of capital up front, especially this kind of business. I would not suggest starting an LGS store ever um, unless you have an incredible amount of capital and you're willing to lose a lot um, up front and probably will end up going out of business. Just assuming, not saying that you're going to be a bad business person, but it's just too hard. It's too hard to start a business. Um, and like Stone Calendar, I mean, by the way, reserve list card. I mean, absolutely, you'll never even look at it again. You'll take it out, but who cares? But that's the thing. Starting a business is much more than just, you know, like having cash. But but that's a, that's a big part of it. You have to have cash first, and then you kind of go from there. Um, but let's say you have the cash. Let's say you have the time to stomach some of this, um, and then you you kind of say, okay, okay, I'm going to spend a little bit of time to invest and kind of be involved in the business, right? And so, first off, how much time do you need to really start the business? Uh I'm not really sure about that one. It depends on how hard you want to go. Like, do you want to travel around the world like me? Do deals? Do you want to always be on Facebook and uh, making phone calls to do deals? Are you looking to, you know, wheel and deal at locally lo local levels? Uh, be around tournaments and such. Uh, do vending, you know, whatever, right? There's a lot of things you can do. But the question is how committed, and that if I, if I, the, the latter I just named all those things, it's going to take you a full work 40 hour week easily, if not more. And at times you might not even want to work. It's going to take you time to work, uh, days that are essentially, uh, going to be days that are, you know, days you may not want to work at all. And that's something what I've noticed is that a lot of people will think, well, I can just do it when I want. No, a lot of times you have customers in Europe. Uh, you know, Canada, uh, you know, wherever, right? Asia, and you're going to end up contacting them at different times. And if you're doing that, if you have customers like that and you're building a base like that, that means that business is doing well. That means business is doing good. That means business is doing really good if your customer base is extremely uh the scalable right large vast and i think that's um, a good kind of a sign people ask me well how do i know that i'm achieving a good business you know how i'm making i'm not really making a lot of money dan but i do have a lot of clients and a network i'm building that is kind of how i would benchmark it is are you getting clients to come back are you getting finding collections to buy are you finding 
people that will, um, you know, is your eBay ID growing and uh, selling, you know, better sales than before? And are you doing YouTube videos? Are you involving yourself with the community to sell and buy and, and be a trusted source? So marketing and branding ends up becoming actually, you know, my most favorite thing because I like interacting with the clients. When I started this business, I wanted to do uh, specific things. And one of the most specific things was to be surrounding myself with the clients and negotiating. And by doing that, it actually brings uh, a tremendous amount of uh, you know, fulfillment that I didn't have you know, in corporate America. And that was for me. Now, there are some clients who end up not actually, um, you know, they're, they're not actually wanting to do the sales. I mean, a lot of magic people tend to be very, 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 um, how would you call it? Like uninterested in the, the negotiation sales. They're kind of that, the owner that likes to uh, play and to, you know, kind of be the behind the scenes type of guy, you know, that type of thing. That's cool. You know, that's all good, but it's not, it's just something that is super, I, I'm not sure. You know, I mean, people say, well, Dan, if, if you're that type of, if that, if, I'm not that type of guy, I'm not got a guy to go out there online be out there and I'm more of the money guy, the more financial guy. I can do the taxes, I can do the accounting, I can do some buying, I can do the numbers. But what makes, how can I get to that point? Because how can I, you know, and the answer to that is you're always going to have to find, then you're going to have to hire someone to fit the mo the areas that you are not, uh, you're deficient in. And every single person is deficient or I want to say deficient, but just lacking skills in certain areas. You'll never find someone that's the best at everything. Like myself, I'm not going to be the best at the accounting. So I hire a good CPA, a good bookkeeper, right? I don't have the time. I used to think I could do the QuickBooks and all that stuff. No. You'll start realizing that, you know, you don't have time for that. And if you're not good at it and you're not interested in it, then the whole thing becomes a big, big uh, waste of time and very inefficient. You'll end up making mistakes and you'll probably have to do it over again or hire someone else. And that's the biggest problem with uh, doing it yourself, the DIY, do it yourself technique, is because you have a situation that you're always having to redo mistakes. And you learn that through a lot of things. Like I thought we first did our website. I could really be the micromanage website guy. Um, and I realized I'm just not into that. Uh, I'm just more into the marketing, the sales, negotiation. So I would hire out outsource. Now, you could obviously hire an employee to do things like that. However, uh, employees cost a lot and a lot of resources too. And that's the problem you get is um, next part of I want to mention is that it's all about overhead. Uh, a lot of startup companies that you start up end up having extremely high overheads. And those overheads become, oh, you know what? I just messed that up. Oh, no. Extremely high overheads. And they, they, they end up becoming a situation where, oh, I just put all the stuff away. I'm going to have to, no, I'm going to on piles. The overheads are so high that they're not able to survive. And we're talking like maybe they want a fancy building. They want to have fancy coffee. They want to do more employees than they need. So basically it's over. It's uh, having too many employees, too many things, uh, and basically not having time for the, the stuff that really matters. And that is a huge problem, a humongous problem. Here we go. And that that puts the point. I might have the last card. It, it, that's the human. That's the main point I, I have to make about it is, if you you got to have a balance of outsourcing employees if needed, uh, retail space if needed, website management if needed, blah blah blah. Those are all things that will probably become, you know, you know, like 
do you get the best? Do you get what kind of server do you get? Do you uh, get this kind of business card? Do you get the nicer one? Do you get a better signage? You know, whatever, right? Do you get an administrative clerk to your customer service? What are the, the things that are important? So all this lies with a great business plan. And I've decided that I think the number one thing that is missing for a lot of businesses is a really, really, really good business plan. You know, what is a business plan? Now, the question is, what is a business plan? How do I make a business plan? Does that even matter in life, uh, et cetera? Well, yeah, I, 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 I think the first step you do is you create that initial business plan. If I was starting out the business, so before you can even, I guess, you know, if I was to kind of, you know, kind of give some advice. I'm give this video is more about advice to starting starting a business. It's obviously the direction it's going. But the first, I've said a lot of like after the fact or things. But the first, one of the first things I always uh, recommend is writing down your business plan. What exactly is the objectives? Uh, what are the profit centers? What are the areas of uh, marketing, you know, sales, how, how's it going to work? So you're probably going to say, well, I want to start a magic business, right? This is what we're talking about here, all magic stuff. So you're going to have to have inventory. You're going to have to have security. You're going to have to have insurance. You're going to have to look at, do I have a retail space here? This is kind of a mess here. Do I, uh, you know, what do I, do I have any employees? Do I want to go the route of food? Do I want to do all that stuff? There's a lot. So many things that I'm not even going to list. <clears throat> and I think with all that in mind, uh, you don't want to forget the vision and the, the, the reasoning behind why you're in business, right? A lot of people forget that. Why am I in business? Why do I love this business? You know, that's important. The, the, the vision the mission statement, as they say, kind of like when you have a job, uh, the regular job, you have a, a, a resume, you have like an objective. And nowadays, objectives on resumes don't matter that much. But for your own business, it really does matter. A lot of people get into this hobby or this business thinking it's easy and quick. No, it's not. They see these big numbers, big sales. They say a thirty thousand dollar alpha mox, and they're all interested in starting a business. I know, I know. There's a couple of companies now that have started a business, uh, you know, kind of online, and they're starting out, and that's great. I love the competition. People will say, "Oh, Dan, how do you feel about competition?" You know, and that's great. I think it's good for everybody. I think good, healthy competition is uh, is good for business. It tells me that the market has the cash and the in the uh, kind of the the depth to kind of grow in this niche market, I'm excited about it. I'm excited to see that because I really feel like that is something that a lot of people, you know, would be like, "Oh no, more competition." But I welcome additional competition, additional because it also keeps you on your toes. So you got to understand that's also part of it. Is you know, competition is inevitable. Now, when you have an LGS store, uh, you deal with more of a different comp comp competition. The competition that comes in an LGS store is like location-based, uh, customer focus based restaurant, food, that kind of thing. That kind of competition, restaurant and communication, all that stuff, that is a massive kind of communication. That's a massive thing. So... People need to understand that um, regards to, you know, if you're starting an LGS store, you have to understand your competition a lot. And it, it, even if you don't, you have a website, yeah, you have to recognize your competition always. You know, I work with a lot of the vendors that are out there. I go to the shows and I have bought from them many times. I have store credit, you know, stuff like that, I anything. Uh, the vendors have contacted me in terms of, hey, Dan, is this real? Do you, you know, expert advice? 
Uh, I've had car shop owners pay for appraisals and be like, hey, Dan, is there, you know, what would you do here? How would you handle it? Is this fake uh, insurance claims? Whatever, right? And so all these come in play when being a, a store because you end up having a, an identity. And the identity uh, sometimes becomes somewhat different than your actual vision statement. And that's kind of intriguing because at first I wanted to create just a big social media type of thing for business and, you know, like kind of a TCG player effect and all that kind of stuff, right? And I really felt like that's kind of the direction I want to go. But it, not only was my passion not really for the technology side of it, I'm not really, I'm not a programmer, I'm not a developer. I, I'm more focused on, you know, the interaction, the negotiating, the sales, the, the business side of it. And I enjoyed it. And so when I got back to my roots and I realized, yeah, I like the older cars, I love the artwork, all that, etc. And you put all those resources into that one thing. It's like putting your resources into one credit card company and getting the most you know, spend and the most credit card limit, whatever. You start getting those kind of things and you start realizing how, um, how much more benefits you get. So it, it's kind of you know, a complex discussion. Because ultimately, you have so much, um, you know, so many things that will change over time. So, if your identity does change, if your identity does lose focus and become something else, it's not necessarily the worst thing in the world. But the problem is, if it starts, let's say it starts making you a lot of money, and let's assume you start making good cash. Some people would argue that that's not a bad thing. That, hey, I can make a lot of money off this. Uh, <clears throat> why, you know, why not, right? Well, the thing is, when you make a lot of money off something, you sometimes get stuck in the same trap as corporate America. Your corporate America job may make six figures and, you know, great health benefits, 401k, everything. But you start losing the identity of what you really love. And that's kind of where the philosophical approach happens in this business is that a lot of people get burnt out. A lot of people I've seen who really end up leaving the business are like, yeah, you know, I can't, I don't really enjoy the grind. You know, I go travel around the world. I'm tired of being on an airplane. Also, life experiences like they have kids now. They have things that are happening in life. So uh, that is a huge, huge factor to any of this, you know, and if, if, if you are someone who has kids and all that, you can understand that if you're not able to invest time in your family and you're always working all the time, it, it takes a damper on every relationship with it being with your wife, your girlfriend, uh, whatever, significant other, um, it takes away a lot. And I would definitely advise that is the, probably the number one signal of problems uh, for sure. Because if you're not able to balance your life at all with uh, work and everything, you know, and magic cards and everything, you're going to have a hard time. And that's kind of the, the closing point on that. Yeah, so, you know, it's a very, very, very complex thing. Everybody thinks that they can just do it. Now... I think ultimately, if you were to um, do it on the side, a lot. One of the ways I think that's really effective is having a job and doing eBay sales and uh, going to a Grand Prix here and there on the weekends. You might have to actually go to a Grand Prix, fly out, tell your wife, "Hey, maybe we go on vacation, but I go to this Grand Prix, right, or, or Magic Fest, whatever." And that's kind of the the way you start out. I think that's a really, really effective approach because it actually uh, brings a couple things. One is you can get your wife involved up front, your girlfriend. You can get, uh, you know, do some stuff with her. And you can also, you know, start engaging with the community, obviously. And that starts becoming uh, a very, very positive thing if you start doing it right. Uh, so I think 
uh, that approach is the best because you also have lower overhead. Now, people ask, well, do I start selling my own inventory? Uh, what does that mean? Like my own stuff. Am I selling my decks? Am I, what am I doing? Uh, that's a tough one. A really, really tough one. If you have personal decks and you have things that you really enjoy in your collection, I wouldn't recommend just selling it so quickly um, because you end up having a situation where uh, you just, I don't know, like you end up regretting it. I, I don't know if that makes sense. Like, so you have, you know, some random lightning bolts here. This is going to, this is taking a lot, obviously a lot more time, but that's the thing is you have stuff that you really, really appreciate and you love and you really want that to be part of the business. I would say I would opt no uh, unless you really want to sell it. And if it, so if you've made the decision that it's a business and it's like, you know, like there's card shops that sell their items, you know what I mean? Like they, uh, they use, they say, well, I'm, I'm basically uh, selling my items as my inventory for my card shop. It's become my full business. Um, so I just don't care anymore. Uh, and that's okay. That's okay. My only commentary on that is that if you at all have an inkling to actually ever care, ever care, I'm just going to really skip this. is all basic. I have to, I'll go through more of the, uh, you know, others later on, but I just want to just kind of get a grips of what's going on here. Just a box of commons, uncommon, not really a lot of rares, uh, but just, you know, stuff that was, yeah, but I really feel like that's, that's kind of where, people fall the trap is they end up playing the game a lot uh magic uh while they're working they don't want to they don't they sold their stuff they go off and end up buying more stuff because they're playing more with their their clients or friends or whatever and they just i don't know it's becoming like a hobby business which doesn't really work unless you're rich already and you know it just doesn't work that's that's kind of how i look at it so, with that said, I think the, the, that topic of focus, being committed to whatever the, the business is, is it a business, is it a game, a hobby business, what is it really? Like, I don't, I don't think a lot of people make that fatal mistake. It's one of the most fatal errors is, uh, you know, play magic all the time with customers or, uh, you know, all, it's almost like the equivalent of a bartender or a business uh, person who's a restaurant and I was sitting at the bar or just eating at the restaurant, you know, just not really working, but just, you know, just doing it as a lifestyle, a lifestyle thing. It's like really, really weird. Like how in the world, I just don't understand, like how in the world does someone actually live that lifestyle? And I don't know how that works. I don't know why people think that they can do it. I don't know. Um, I, I just find it to be very depressing, to be honest. Like if you were a business owner and all you did was sit there and you just just kind of drank the Kool-Aid, consumed the resources of what you have, basically, um, you know, I don't know, just kind of, you know what I mean? It's just, that doesn't make any sense. It's like owning a casino, but all you're doing is you're gambling uh, all the time. And I don't know, it may be sound fun at first, but it ends up becoming like depressing. Like, uh, aren't you the owner? Uh, yeah. Uh, why are you here? Uh, because I'm, uh, I'm an addict. Yeah, I see that all the time. I mean, I see a lot of owners. I mean, sad. Get into a lifestyle of doing too much of that into the market or uh, into the gambling or uh, well, so gambling is an interesting thing. Like there's a lot of magic players that like to gamble, play poker. They think they can just, you know, gamble away their money. And that's another problem with the lifestyle aspect of magic is that, um, uh, in the card industry, there's a lot of cash being flown, uh, being, you know, traded and stuff a lot. And people don't understand that, that you got to differentiate your time and do you, you go out there and drink and party with your friends 
And then when you go visit these Grand Prix or Magic Fests, or are you committed towards your business? I mean, there's obviously a fine line of, of kind of interacting with, with clients, which I can accept and agree, which I do all the time. But do you just stay out all the time and, you know, or do you keep your nose to the grindstone? And that's probably the hardest thing is, do you do that? Or do you, I don't know, how do you manage that? And that's another topic people really um, forget to look at is how do you actually manage time? How do you actually make it something where, um, you know, it? how do you find that? And so I, I get asked that once in a while. And so I'll hit on it is that uh, part of my balance with my life is that I center my life around the kids and, you know, my wife and make sure that they're always first. Uh, I know that's kind of like, well, how do you do that if you are trying to make money in magic? You know, if you're trying to make money, Dan, uh, aren't you supposed to put the, the business first? And, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't think a lot of people in magic have a good lifestyle for that. I definitely have, uh, would say that I have found a successful formula in giving my kids uh, opportunities and my wife first beyond magic. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why. Uh, you know, I want to say every relationship is perfect, but it, it makes me happiest, right? And so you have to, you have to balance that. You have to want that. Um, and a lot of people, you know, will argue and say, "Well, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I can do that. Like, also, you know, I don't want to see my wife that much. I want to do my own thing. And I can understand you want to." Have a lot of focus and you know you got you and your wife may have a different relationship and that's hard you know relationships are hard i've had encounters with that in my relationship is that you know my wife is very career directed and i want more time with her and she still has her job and that's a point of contention for our relationship for years and it's hard because you have a, a need you know one person has a need and a, and a need you know so you have to compromise and that's part of the balance of the relationship of life is how and find what will work. But ultimately, I believe that if you're doing this as a magic business, you need to start developing, um, how would you call it, like disciplines that are extremely, um, uh, extremely like consistent. Like they cannot, you cannot deter from the, the, the plan. You got to be a steady Eddie, right? And it means a lot. A lot of people here who watch this videos, I hope, uh, are more established. But some of you guys might be younger and such watching this and not be as established. And they don't know how to keep their nose to the grindstone. Uh, that saying is huge. Like being focused, right? That's kind of how it is. Keep your nose to the grindstone. Keep your nose focused into the plan, right? The, the, mo the more important things in life. And a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people just, uh, you know, end up flailing away in their their plan, and you know, and the the, the business crumbles. And that personal uh, that approach, keep your nose to the grindstone, is something that I remember hearing years and years ago. That it just becomes like instilled in me, you know, like like ingrained that you know if you don't focus on what you're trying to do, the ultimate plan, your vision, ultimately it will fail. And uh, it doesn't matter how much money you have or you made, you're going to be very unhappy all the time. And that's kind of the takeaway on that. I, I felt like um, it's worth sharing. A lot of people, you know, really don't understand uh, how, how hard it is from a personal perspective to just manage. And you guys, I might be missing some cards here and there just going through, but it's just, I, I feel like I'm skimming. And you'll have to do some more detailed stuff, but I, I've done a pretty good detailed job of going through it. But you know, there's some, definitely some commons and uncommons that are just kind of like, eh. And, and I'm not really, you know, I really, I also want to say like, you know, a lot of people don't understand like a business 
has to make a profit and they expect margins to be so tight that almost like they just, there's nothing to be made. And it's not, you cannot take anything to offense. That's another thing is you can't be taken personally. It's business. If, if, if someone doesn't want to buy your stuff uh, or, um, you know, they don't want to buy it from you or sell to you or whatever, don't be offended. It, it's just business. It's just the way it is in life. Not every deal can be won by you. And that's the thing you have to understand. You can't be the best. You can't be, you know, you have to be, you have to be who you are. And if you really care, another thing is you have to care about, you have to be willing to take criticism. That includes work and life and things. I, for run, I really appreciate the criticism, a constructive criticism. I obviously know the difference between a troll and someone that, you know, actually gives me criticism. I listen to constructive criticism every day. And it's really hard, really exhausting to hear like dumb, dumb stuff that really doesn't do anything. But you want to, you want to just, you know, you want to get, you want, you want people to kind of give you some constructive criticism and so you can learn from that. And that's a cool thing. You know, you get friends in a network. So speaking of network, that's kind of how the next topic will be is. Do you have a network that that gives you the ability to talk to, uh, you know, clients or other vendors around the world and become uh, someone that you can, you know, dig ideas and have both? And that's really important to understand is that if you don't, you know, you the the the, the thing is a lot of people have a network but their network is only within their community. I would recommend getting out of that play group and community and start focusing on a beyond that. And a lot of people, you know, if you're not into social skills and that kind of thing, that's not your thing. That's a force there. Uh, I can understand that. It's something that really is a train. It's a talent, right? It takes time. Not everybody can be outgoing and all that kind of thing, right? So, the way you do that, one of the things I've noticed uh, developing yourself socially is if you're people that are not social, is to go to, uh, well, hang out with people that are social, okay? And then what you do is you start, uh, you just ask them for advice. Try to learn from them and just appreciate, you know, and learn how, like, how do they do it? How do you get business? What are you doing and saying that is so like powerful, right? Like what are you saying? What are the, your friends and who are more social doing, saying, you know, or you can watch YouTube videos and get advice from here. But ultimately what is, what are, what is happening that is that they're doing differently and that's part of the humility factor of life and business is that you got to like start appreciating and understanding that, hey, other people are going to be better than you. That's kind of a, a tough thing to, uh, to succumb, but that's just the way it is. Like, I'm not going to be the top dog, you know, and that's okay. You know, I can't be the top dog all the time. You know, I can't always do that. That's really, really important to understand that. And I don't think under, people understand, like, like I need to absorb and sponge with that network. Um, I've done that so many times. I mean, even though I'm extremely outgoing, I am type A plus personality, never stop talking. A lot of people would say that about me. Um, but I, I listen a lot too. And that's something I've learned over the years is that as I keep growing and such, I, 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 I obviously need to listen more. I mean, I still need to work on that. I mean, dude, it's completely important, importantly, purely um, true that I need to continually learn and focus and start becoming more of a better listener. That's probably, that's easily my bet worst, my, my one area of weakness, right? That I can improve on myself. And, you know, I, I've obviously need to do a better job of that, a much better job of that. And so that's kind of how I would look at it is 
identifying your weaknesses, identifying your strengths. And then I would also identify like, do I have, um, you know, do I have an ability to actually, uh, I don't know, just kind of change. You know, I've kind of had this thing where do I, in life, like, do I want to change? Do I want to make a difference? Do I want to kind of, you know, be involved with the community stuff? I mean, how does that work? You know, I just don't understand. Like, people don't understand. Like, that. that is like a huge factor in life. You have to be able to change and adapt and make changes and differences in life. That's a huge difference. Huge difference between successful people and people that are just dead broke. And that's really important, you know. And that's kind of kind of how I look at it is if you don't make changes, uh, if you don't make a difference uh, in, you know, community and also in general, right, your family, everything, you end up, uh, man, this is crazy. The Chiefs are up 34-24 uh, third quarter, and that's insane. They The Texans were once up 24-0. <laughs> Texans suck, man. Yeah, I would feel so bad if I'm a Houston fan. I would feel horrible. Yeah, it's just, you know, I feel like in life, you only have one shot, right? You only obviously have one chance to make a first impression. You can sit there and, you know, pick your nose and just talk badly about people. Or you can focus all that energy of talking shit about people. And focus on yourself and focus on the surround yourself with people that really appreciate you. And I've been blessed. This is one of the things I've really had a something I've learned over the years. I've been blessed to really have people in my life who have stood by me through many, many, many decades of years of just ups and downs. Uh, my friend Jeremy, my friend Al, my friend Nick, who passed away. These are people that are just lifelong friends. And, you know, I can tell you that I really feel like I could have never gone where I'm at without them, you know, in many ways. Like, they stood by me when no one thought I could do it. They stood by me when, you know, like the beginnings of time, you know, like just, you know, how you start a business or anything. You just don't know, right? They stood by me in the beginning. And that that is, I'm telling you guys, that is that kind of loyalty, that kind of trust and um, relationship you have with people uh, is priceless. It's more than any money in the world. And I think that's something that I really like to be is generous. I think my generosity level, I think people, if you know me, will say I'm very generous with people um, that I really love. And that's something that I really, really, um, it's not a pride thing. It's more about, I just naturally want to, I feel like I've been given a lot of resources and a lot of opportunities in life and without, uh, the community and people that really have treated me well, um, that's kind of how I do it. And, you know, even certain artists and uh, collectors and investors, I spend more time with them and give them more business or more opportunities first. These are things that are important to understand. Like my relationship with certain clients are so deep that they just come to me first and it doesn't matter what it is. They, they don't leave me, you know, it's like sometimes also price, like price may be obviously a factor, but a lot of times they just, they'll end up paying a little bit more for me. You know, they'll pay if it makes sense, right? If the quality is there, the service, they know they're going to get. Wouldn't you pay a little bit more? Wouldn't you pay a better price for something where you feel like, you know, you're, you're getting a better service and value? And value is really where it lies for the business side. You know, I, I feel like if you set, centralize your business technique towards value, meaning creating creating a demand of like hey you know this this company is providing a service something that others cannot right 
Others cannot. Others cannot provide that quality that they can. And I got to say, like, you know, you know that from your LGS store. You know that from your friends or tr people that you're trading with. You can identify as a business and as an individual in a business, which are the vendors and customers that value you. And I'm talking about both ways. It's not just uh, the car, the the buy, the um, vendors and people that are selling you cards, but it's the, the buyers. Do the collectors value you and do they actually give a rat's butt, you know, rat's ass about you? Do they want you to make money too? Is it, you know, in many cases, what they call a win-win in the hobby? And that win-win is where everybody wants to be, right? Everybody wishes to be, you know, and a lot of people never get there. Um, it's a really hard thing. It's a really hard thing. You know? I really think that value in a business, finding value with your clients, it, it's a, it has to come down to, who can you speak to and, and work with and trust? And there's a lot of little, uh, what do you call it? White weenie cards, but I'm not going to grab those. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Is uh, I think I'll kind of end it on this topic is ultimately um, the, the, value, the value of your business. You have to give yourself and show people, customers and also uh, vendors, whoever you are, professionalism and show them that you value them and that their time is valuable. They're not sitting there wasting their time, but also, you know, you can't get mad if someone doesn't want to sell you something. Don't say, Hey, I, you wasted my time. You didn't sell us. It was a big waste of time, but that's, that's this business. You can't win every deal. You can't get everything. So you need to understand that just because you didn't win that battle, that, that negotiation, that doesn't mean you don't get an opportunity later on. Because if you were professional and you did the right thing by you know, showing that, hey, I'm, 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 I'm an interested party. I, I, I did the numbers. It didn't pan out, but it will, it could pan out later on. And that's the type of thing that is different than other people is that there is people that see, you know, like value. In, in, in everybody. I, I don't think people understand that because a lot of times they get very like uh, fixated on their emotions of how did that person treat me, whatever. And I'll be honest, if you're a person that does that, you're not going to be a person that actually will, uh, in fact, uh, be successful. I don't think you're going to be successful if you're focused all the time on what people say about you. That's another thing is, you know, sorry guys, uh, for some reason there I cut off, but yeah, I was talking about, um, you know, thicker skin, what people say about you. And I think that's kind of the, 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 the name of the game is that it doesn't matter what industry you're in, you're always going to get, uh, trolls always attacking you and stuff. And if you, there's a saying, like if you're successful, uh, you know, you are successful basically because people are attacking you. That's kind of how it is. I mean, successful people are always uh, kind of attacked. It's just kind of the nature. And I think, you know, even though you provide a great value, a great, a great service and all that stuff, you can't let the, the, the naysayers affect you. Uh, that's probably one of the, the things that I really – really think what's hard for me in the beginning was I wanted to kind of appease every naysayer. And I realized that it's never going to happen. They're, they're going to talk, talk crap about me and it doesn't matter because ultimately kind of end this video today. You ultimately are control of your own business and life. You have an ability to, uh, you have an opportunity to create a, a brand that people can trust. And if you're so easily, like a lot of people are influenced by other people's reasoning and not making your own reasoning and not being professional and then talking shit about other people, it, 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 it makes you always stalemated in business. 
I think the only way you can be successful in business is if you're willing to kind of grow and learn from other people. You're willing to be humble and take advice and give advice also and be professional. Also, you know, you got to understand, don't take it personally. Don't overspend financially. Um, have too many, you know, Nespresso machines or, you know, what are fancy, uh, you know, hotel rooms or whatever. In the beginning, you'll probably have to travel if you do. Uh, in lower end hotels, and that's okay. That's part of the humility part, and all this comes in line. Like, you know, do I take care of my family first? Do I take care of my 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 people that have been there for me in the beginning? You know, that's really important to to, to appreciate and understand. Is that if you don't get that as your if you don't put your values first, if you don't put the people that you value and network who've been there for you, you know, you're, uh, it's, it's just, it's really hard to succeed. And a lot of times you'll realize that, well, you know, this friend or this person really was never my friend. This person was never my friend. They just used me for money. They used me for my resources or time. And you're going to have to go through that. It's just the hardest thing is you're going to have to go through some of that negativity. Um, every, incredible business or person in the world of business is has gone through and always will go through negativity and if you don't go through that honestly i don't think i don't think you've gone through if you don't go through that kind of thing i I never would wish horrible things to you but it's just the way life works is learning all right guys well thanks for watching this video james thanks for letting me ramble and just look at your collection here Uh, if you guys have any questions or thoughts in life, let me know. Um, yeah, it's just cool to always see cool old cards. But, I mean, this is a pretty long video series uh, today. And I uh, hope you guys got something out of it. Uh, starting a business or just just understanding, you know, what are what things I look at and look for uh, in life. And uh, I always wish you guys the best. Happy 2020. And we'll talk to you guys soon in the next video. Take care. Thank you everyone for joining me. It's me, Daniel, with VintageMagic.com. I'm excited to share more about our appraisal services. All right, so the first step of the appraisal process is determining if your items are authentic. After determining that the items are authentic, we will then do a market evaluation of your items. So oftentimes, clients ask me, hey Dan, I want to insure my collectibles. Well, after the authenticity and evaluation part of the appraisal process, I would then construct an official letter and we would send that off to the insurance company. Your insurance provider would then offer you insurance based on the valuations and authenticity. We also offer pre-grading services. So collectors who are looking to save money on grading um, can go through us. We will actually grade and authenticate the cards before you send it off to grading and that will save you potentially thousands of dollars on grading fees. Also, we offer estate collection services. So basically, if you've acquired a collection over the years, either from a family member or yourself, and you wanna pass it down to your, uh, your kids, uh, we're able to determine valuations based on the levels of today. Vintage Magic. Game. Collect. Invest. For more information about our consulting and professional services, visit VintageMagic.com. Thank you.